Hey folks, it's Santa here with the audio.com and I just want to take a quick look in this video at impulse responses. There's lots of stuff out there telling us what they're all about, how to use them, but I'm just going to focus in on something that I know can be a bit of a puzzle until you get your head around it, and that is when you get your impulse library and you know you get all excited if you download it and you open it up, and what you find is that you've got this set of folders, and somewhere along the way, as well as finding the ones that you're actually looking for, that have got your sort of choices of cabinets and speakers and microphones and microphone positions and all that stuff, you find these things that give you lots of different sample rates and that give you different sample lengths. And I remember looking at those and thinking, what am I supposed to do with these? How am I supposed to make a decision about what to use? How much does it matter? So here's a little bit of insight into that. Right, so first things first, what is an impulse response? And basically, it's just a little bit of audio. It's pumped through the speaker, through the cab, it's recorded, and we get it as a WAV file. And if we load one into, or if we load a bunch of them into a project to try and get some idea of what they're about, you notice that the 200 millisecond version, sample rate 44.1, this project's at 44.1, and the 200 millisecond one lasts 0.2 of a second, which is 200 milliseconds and the 500 millisecond one is basically the same impulse response, just with a much longer decay tail captured on it, and lasts 0.5 of a second, which is 500 milliseconds. It's just as a matter of interest, the one recorded at a sample rate of 88.2K, the 200 millisecond version has got twice as many samples in it as the 44.1 version, so it lasts twice as long and has half the pitch. If you want to get an idea of what one of these things actually sounds like, I have taken one of these impulse, one of these impulse responses and stretched it right out. So this is what it would sound like. But all compressed down into 0.2 of a second. So that's what our impulses are like. They behave just like any other piece of audio that we might put into a project, except of course that we never intended to put them in a project and just listen to them. So I have set up a couple of sources that we can have a listen to and see what happens when we use these impulses as they're meant to be loaded into an impulse response loader or a convolver. So the convolver that I have chosen is this one from Ignite Amps. It's called NAD IR, at least I think that's how you pronounce it. And I've chosen it because it's just an IR loader, so we've not got to worry about, say, using an AMPSIM and then turning off modules and wondering if they've really turned off or not. And also because it's free, so if you need one, you can go to the Ignite AMPS website. I presume it's still there, and just grab this one. The other thing that I have set up on each one of these groups, ah, let me just explain how I've done this. So I've got a channel which has got a signal generator. So I'm putting an identical signal, which is going out to each of two group channels. One of them has got an IR which was recorded at 44K. One has got the same IR but the 88K version of it. In each case, I'll put a plugin, a frequency plugin, Cubase frequency um, EQ plugin. I've bypassed all the bands on it. I just want it for the display. And then I've got a final um, stereo output plugin as well. So I can see what the, what the sum display at the end of there is. So if I just kick off a simple sine wave, which remember is going through both of these impulse responses before it's hitting the EQ. And there we go, I've got my 440 hertz sine wave and it's coming out as a 440 hertz peak on both of those uh, channels, which is telling us that the use of an 88K impulse response is not suddenly doing anything bizarre like doubling our frequency or anything like that. And you can see that on the output plugin, we've got a bigger version where those have added in together. And if I uh, invert the polarity of one of these, you can see that that disappears off. Now, it's not completely cancelling out, but it's vanishing down to the point where you really can't hear anything from it. That's how similar they are. But the big takeaway is that we're not suddenly getting any frequency anomalies occurring. And we get the same thing happening. If I take triangle wave, these things have sort of each got different makeup of harmonic series that goes with them. Same sort of thing if I go with white noise, pink noise, same sort of pattern is happening. And I think that what this 
gives us is the fact that when we take our impulse responses, whichever sample rate we're using, I suspect that the IR loader is doing some upsampling, downsampling of its own anyway, and is simply not faced by the fact that it's getting different sample rates in there. So that all works quite nicely. But of course, that just tells us what a signal generator sounds like. If I move us over to this track, which has got a DI'd guitar part on it, and if I just bypass those for the moment, and as you can hear, that's a not very interesting DI guitar part. If I run it through an amp sim, I've got Bias Amp 2. And in that amp sim, I have got a Celestian Impulse loaded within the sim itself. So what I'm now going to do is drag that off the line. So that's what it sounds like without any impulse in place. But then exactly as we did with the test signal, I'm going to route those through my two groups, which have got these impulse responses loaded. So and do the cancellation thing again. So same effect with a real signal, we're still getting that cancellation. We're still getting the same frequency, in fact. And just to kind of make the point, if I then on my second channel switch over and I am going to use the five hundred millisecond version of the impulse. Cancelling. And again, that's cancelling right, right down. And the point of that one is that the only difference that we are really getting out of that longer file is theoretically there is going to be some difference in the, the robustness of the lower end, but the 200 millisecond one is quite adequately long enough to capture the full detail that we need there anyway. If we're using a distant room mic, something like that, then we're going to capture more of the room in the 500 millisecond one. So I know that these levels are really low, but hopefully you can just about hear, or at least still see on the meters, that we're getting less complete cancellation when we go out to the room mics. And that's because we've got that longer tail of information coming back on the 500 millisecond response that there's nothing to cancel out against from the 200 millisecond response. And that's why what we're hearing, that sort of slightly phasey sound, is literally just the room with very little direct sound left in it. But seriously, on a close mic'd cab, I have never heard a difference. And in fact, when I had a different manufacturer's Convolver plug-in that I used to use, that was actually truncating the samples, I never noticed the difference because I was only ever using it on close mic stuff. So there we go. I think the point to take away is that those impulse responses are simply little bursts of audio. They behave exactly like audio if we try to listen to them. But once we load them into a decent Convolver plug-in, the Convolver is going to be smart enough to get us out of the majority of trouble we'll ever get into by getting the wrong sample rate. Just use the sample rate that matches your project the short of the 200 millisecond sample is absolutely adequate for just about everything that most of us will ever do, especially if we're working on close mic sounds. And if we want something that's got more room in it, that's got, got the, the full sort of ambience tail out, then use the longer one and be prepared to take a bit of a CPU hit for doing that stuff. And if you get it wrong, really do not worry too much about it because it's not going to ruin your project. Okay, so this is Andy Pickler at thedustbowlaudio.com. I hope that is of some use to you. Take it easy and I'll catch up with you soon.